Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Wrong Turn 2 Dead End, released direct to DVD in 2007. Real fast though, first I have to apologize for missing a kill in the original Wrong Turn. There was a mid-credits scene wherein another ranger guy got killed by a very burnt three-finger off-screen. I feel bad for missing it, but now you know that Wrong Turn has 10 kills instead of 9. My bad. Moving on! With most most horror franchises, you usually get one or two sequels made by the original filmmakers before the series spins out into self-parody. Not really the case with Wrong Turn. Dead End came out four years after the original, with none of the cast or crew involved, save for producers Robert Colzer and Eric Feig, the latter of whom was a producer on all of the last summer films, even the third one, my favorite. To be honest, the first Wrong Turn wasn't some classic that needed to be continued. At the end of the day, it's a pretty unremarkable cannibal slasher. But I'm at least glad they made this second film, since it increases the blood and gore while serving up a much more interesting story and cast of characters. Directed by Joe Lynch, who would go on to make the very fun mayhem, Wrong Turn 2 follows a cast and crew on the set of a Survivor-esque reality show in rural West Virginia. It's kind of similar to Halloween Resurrection in that regard, except it's not a piece of shit. Especially cause we trade out Buster Rhymes for Henry Rollins. No offense to Mr. Rhymes, but the frontman of Black Flag playing a U.S. Marine is just way more badass than, uh, you know, this. <laughs> As I mentioned, the sequel really ups the gore, so how about we get a sponsor up in this bitch? If there's one time of day you don't want to see blood, it's when you're grooming yourself downstairs. That's why I'm grateful for Manscaped. Manscaped offers the perfect tools for your family jewels. In fact, the Perfect Package 3.0 kit includes the Lawnmower 3.0, a water-resistant cordless body trimmer that I just tested out last night. And I'm very happy to say that my equipment is nick-free. You can get 20% off and and free shipping by using promo code DEADMEAT at manscaped.com. And for a limited time, when you get the perfect package, you can get two free gifts as well. This really nice travel bag and some anti-chafing boxer briefs that I can't really show you right now because I'm wearing them. Again, use promo code DEADMEAT at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. Now let's see how many survivors we have in this reality show of death and get to the kills. The movie begins in the back country of West Virginia. I always prefer working back of country over front of country. Don't have to deal with all the customers, you know? Another Mustang, red instead of Chris's blue from the original, is making its way down the road. And real talk, the revolving crane shot of this moving vehicle is low-key awesome. That's the work of cinematographer Robin Lowen, who director Joe Lynch absolutely loved. He never told me no, he told me no problem. And at the same time, serving my crazy shots, like I want it to spin 180 degrees and go up someone's butt, you know? And he's like, um, what would the F-stop be up there? Driving this Mustang is former American Idol contestant Kimberly Caldwell, who's playing a fictional version of herself here, which is always kind of fun. She's super pissed because she's lost in the sticks while trying to find the set of a reality show she's been cast in. And not even Eddie Grant blaring from the speakers is gonna help her feel better about it. Oh, no. She reaches a fork in the road, and her manager on the phone, voiced by Patton Oswalt, warns her not to make any mistakes about what movie she's in. Kimbo, you can't afford to make a wrong turn here. You really don't have the time. Eventually, she loses his call and ends up hitting a dude full fucking force, sending that guy flying. Damn, Kimberly, you're not even near any docks from which to dump his body. Prompts to stunt coordinator Jacob Rupp, by the way, for ensuring that car hit went smoothly without any injuries. We should never take stunt work for granted. Kimberly Kimberly tells the guy she's gonna get him help, even as he spits up blood like a grenadine fountain, but of course he ends up grabbing her and snatching off a big chunk of face flesh with his teeth. That's buckalicious! Another mountain man shows up while the first one properly adjusts himself, and this new hefty feller murders Kimberly Caldwell by splitting her in two with an axe. Lots of viscera on display, but it doesn't slow down either of these cannibals as they get to work lugging their haul away. The 
This movie's fun music that you just heard is by Bear McCreary in one of his earliest film scores. He's done a ton of great work in horror, but I may have most recently mentioned him in the Kill Count for the Child's Play remake. Also, since this is an effects-heavy film, let's just go ahead and look at those guys right now, too. The makeup effects were designed by Bill Terazakis, whose work is all over this channel. Most notably in Freddy vs. Jason, where he was trusted with the design of both titular villains, and Final Destination 2, which had all those great practical effects I celebrated last year. Terazakis' latex mouth for Kimberly Caldwell took nearly two hours to apply and caused the singer host to drool all over the damn place. You drooled on me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> also on the effects team was PJ Vincent, who helped make Kimberly's bifurcated body using silicone skin covering an armature skeleton. It took them two weeks to build, which isn't a ton of time for something like this, but it still looks freaking great, right? I mean, Kimberly thought so. They did a banging job, right? Glad she liked it, since she had to do a full body cast to replicate every inch of her. Finally, they used a pretty simple bag of blood and guts for that money splatter shot. Great way to start off your horror movie, Joe. Maybe don't uh, lick that, though. You might get a reputation. The director's kind of crazy. Too late! We're treated to a very intense promo for the reality show Kimberly had been cast in. It's called Ultimate Survivalist, and it's hosted by Colonel Dale Murphy of the U.S. Marines, played by legendary punk musician Henry Rollins. The six contestants, as we see, are Kimberly, who sports a lick-on-looking snake tattoo, a skateboarder named Jonesy, who has big Dolph Ziggler energy, and who should probably learn how to edit his audition tapes. Ow! No, just, uh, that sucked, dude. What are you doing? Uh, can we do that again? Our requisite hottie hot Elena, played by Crystal Lowe, she of the Black Christmas remake and the Tanning Bed Death in Final Destination 3, Jockey Jake, hailing from the mitten and played by Texas Battle, who was also in Final Destination 3. His character sucked in that movie, but he's pretty great here. Nina, an artsy brooding type, played by Erica Learson, last seen on the kill count, fighting a different family of cannibals in the Texas Chainsaw remake, and and finally, Marine Amber, who served in Afghanistan and whose nickname is La Conquistadora. She's played by Daniela Alonso. The still living contestants join the crew on set, where they lampshade their show's similarity to that Jeff Probst jam. You know, I still don't see what makes this show any different from the other survival show. I don't watch television. Supposed to take place at the end of the world, man. This apocalyptic themed show will have its six contestants split off into pairs, which is gonna suck for whoever gets stuck with Jonesy, the human hard on. I could help you spread it on all those hard to reach places. Since Kimberly's a no show, Colonel Dale convinces producer Mara Stone to save the gameplay by filling in. She's not an outdoorsy person, so she's reluctant to be a contestant. But it can't be any worse than being married to Jimmy Darmody, so you got this, girl. Especially with some encouragement from the show's creator slash editor, her boyfriend Michael. It's M now. Not Michael. Sorry. Her boyfriend asshole. Er, M. Her boyfriend M. Sweet Battle Royale shirt, though. Dale leads them through the woods to their super survivory set, like seriously, where are the torches, and tells them that their first task is to go forage for food, which may be a tall order for some of these idiot contestants. Who's got a number two? Well, I did a number two back at the gas station. <laughs> Come on, dude, that was funny. Dale goes over some game mechanics involving radiation poisoning cards, but I'm not gonna get into how this fictional game show works. It's not important, y'all. I do like the bit where the crew mouths along with Dale's spiel, though. And Henry Rollins makes a solid host. But only one of you can be the ultimate survivalist after the apocalypse. He's also a solid guy, since he shouts down Jonesy for his sex pesting and tells Mara she's tougher than she looks. She can rise above her insecurities and go far in this game. Henry Rollins was a great get for this movie, and it sounds like he got along well with the very energetic director Joe Lynch, who was making his feature-length directorial debut. I really like to be around people who are intense have a lot of energy and enthusiasm for what they're doing. Cell phones are collected by crew member Neil, and the contestants split off into the woods. Amber is stuck with Jonesy, Mara gets the disinterested Nina, and Elena and Jake are put together with lurid intentions. Since Michael is following them around with a camera, no one's in the editing trailer watching camera feeds when crew member Neil gets his pee interrupted by a throat slit and a scalping. Hmm, I bet the cannibals can make that scalp into a jerky of some kind. I don't know. 
know, just spitballing here. Colonel Dale is putting up cameras in the forest when some arrows start a flying at him. An axe introduces Three Finger back into the fold, and although Dale puts a knife in the mutant's shoulder, it does nothing to deter him or his appetite for blood. Keep that appetite going, Three Finger, cause Dale's on the menu tonight. Marine Amber, a real MacGyver of the forest, realizes that she hasn't heard or seen any animals in these woods since they started, outside of her obnoxious partner Jonesy, of course. It's like we're all alone. We could get all nasty, nobody'd see a thing, except for 30 million people. She tells him she's not into any guys, cause she's a lesbian. Which is not the case for Elena, who's trying to make the moves on Jake at the direction of M. For some reason, this dude is trying to shoot a porno, as though that's gonna help him get a deal with ABC. And although Elena goes along with the plan, Jake isn't into it at all. Well look man, I'm here to play the game, okay? Elena still wants extra screen time though, so she gets to work on M's bottom line. Not knowing that there's a horny mountain mutant watching them from afar. Mara trips a wire that forces her to deal with one of those radiation gameplay mechanics, and despite her earlier self-doubts, she manages to brave a river like the poor kitty in Homeward Bound and successfully complete the task, which even earns her praise from the prickly Nina. I can't believe I did it! You kicked off! Aw, that's nice. But less nice is discovering that your boyfriend's cheating on you via some poorly mimed fellatio. Mara wants to be done with this game now, but instead of going back to the trailer, she decides to check for a phone in this random cabin right in the middle of the shooting location? Did this show not have a location, Scout? They should know this place was here! The cabin doesn't have a phone in it, but it does have pictures of a deformed family, and sounds like some of them are home now. The ladies watch from behind a door as the sister cannibal of this family wreathes in pain, cause it's birthing time! And let me tell you, birthing baby mutants is one messy affair. The child is born deformed, much like the rest of this family, who have just discovered Nina and Mara in their home. The ladies get away by crawling underneath the house, but their escape into the woods is cut short when an axe finds itself in Mara's head! Holy shit! Mara had Final Girl written all over her! You fucking got me wrong, Turn 2. You boomed me! Mara's kill was accomplished using the Snorri Cam, named after Icelandic photographers Einar and Eider Snorri. You've seen it used in a whole bunch of movies and music videos, usually to show disorientation. Under the coordination of effects artist Bob Comer, a fake axe was rigged to the Snorri Cam and swung into actor Alexa Palladino's head. Impressively, they got this shot in a single take. The biggest cannibal, Pa, takes his arrows out hunting for Nina. He finds her headset camera on the ground and puts it on, but he doesn't sniff her out from behind a log before his ride pulls up with Mara's bloody body strapped to the hood. Pa takes off with the driver, his wife Ma, and Nina breathes a sigh of relief. With his adultery complete, M heads back to the production trailer while Elena stays behind to sunbathe. Teenage cannibal brother watches and faps to the site until he's caught by his cannibal sister, the one who gave birth earlier, presumably to brother's baby. She's jealous of the object of brother's mutant gaze, so she runs out and attacks Elena, catching her on the shoreline and killing her by slashing her back to total shreds. Damn, sister went so hard she ended up exposing Elena's spine, like she's part 7 Jason. With the bloodletting complete, the bloodlusting can begin. And boy do you hate to see it, folks. Colonel Dale regains consciousness, tied up and upside down, where he sees Neil's body across the way and a three finger in his face, wearing part of Neil's head. The little bat Bastard stabs him a few times before making a big show of both sharpening his blade and using said blade to eviscerate Neil's body. Fun stuff from Three Finger, but it's worth noting that he's now played by stunt performer Jeff Scrutton instead of original actor Julian Richings, who, yes, plays Death in Supernatural. I don't watch Supernatural or Buffy, so apologies when I miss those credits. Since Dale's a mighty marine, he's able to attack TF and free himself. He and the mutant have an all right fight with each other that ends with a shotgun blast and a wire stunt that makes Three Finger do a cannibal cannonball into the nearby lake. 
lake. M gets back to the trailer and starts to check out all the forest cams, but as he's tending to a technical issue, the headset wearing Pa climbs into the cab with Ma and they begin to drive it away, just like in the long, long trailer. And though the M gets attacked, the car keeps driving and nobody would stop to save him from getting an arrow through the shoulder. Jonesy and Amber come across a campsite filled with food, exactly what they're looking for. Though Amber thinks it's a little too good to be true, they take the meat with them back to their survivor set and share it with Jake, who's also returned by now. That means he's stuck hanging out with Jonesy. <laughs> Shit ghost. Shit ghosts aside, the three contestants get along and open up about what they would do with the prize money if they won. There's actually some shades of character development here. Since Jake wants to go into sports medicine after suffering an injury that ended his football career, and Amber wants to free herself from a debt to her father who disapproves of her sexuality. Nina gets back to the set and tells them that Mara has been killed by cannibal hillbillies. And although Jonesy thinks it's just part of the game, his skepticism is erased when they realize they've been eating some grade-A Caldwell steaks, judging by that tattoo right there. Game's over. Yeah, I'd say on-camera cannibalism's probably gonna keep this show from getting picked up. They get back to the RV site and find the trailer gone, causing Jonesy to name drop his favorite YouTube channel. We're dead meat! They decide to go to an old paper mill in hopes of finding a phone and head through the woods to get there. On their way, they come across a cannibal sex party going on between the brother cannibal and the sister cannibal, who's wearing Elena's scalp. Kinka! Nina abandons the others and runs off on her own, eventually falling into a hidden pit, while Jonesy gets his arm slashed by a blade. Amber and Jake are able to fight the mutants off and get away, though they're unable to put them down for good because, you know, mutant strength or whatever. Once again, the survivors split up, with Jake finding Nina and helping her out of that pit. The two of them are chased by Sister with a gun until they're forced to high dive into a lake. At the cannibal cabin, where meats are dry to plenty, an old man arrives to start cleaning up the mess. Colonel Dale puts a gun to the dude, and we see that it's the guy from the gas station in the first movie. Don't kill me, brother. I'm a good Christian man. Dale fixes himself up while the old guy gets his Pepto fix and tells him about the mutants out here. They're deformed and have super strength due to leftover chemicals from the old paper mill, which also killed all the animals in the area. Most folks round these parts left. There's one family stayed on this hall. The old timer says the deformed family continued to procreate with each other, causing further mutations, and then reveals that he's part of the family! Oh no! He's no match for Dale, though, who grabs a stick of dynamite, lights its fuse, and stuffs it into the old dude's pants before running away. Really glad you did that, Daddy Dale, because this kill is one explosive fucking mess. I absolutely love it, especially the hilarious face actor Wayne Robson makes before he blows up. For this kill, they stuffed a fake body full of detonation cord, big old blood sausages, and some caviar-looking blood gel. It was obviously a huge, dangerous stunt, but it went off without a hitch, which really pleased director Joe Lynch. Nobody go in. Cut cameras, please. Nobody else. You were there one minute. Jonesy and Amber have become a twosome again, but her kick-assery in the brother-sister fight has finally gotten Jonesy to apologize for being a dick. I was a total asshole before. I'm, I'm never gonna diss you or any other female ever again. Great. Their heart-to-heart -heart nearly gets killed by a Cupid arrow from Pa, and while running to escape the mutant, Jonesy's caught up in a snare trap that leaves him swinging upside down. He tells Amber to save herself, but she refuses to leave him behind, and eventually gets caught in another trap right next to him. They're swinging there helpless when Brother and Pa find them, and looks like it's the perfect opportunity for some father-son bonding. Amber promises to get them out of there, while Jonesy begins to divulge some backstory. My mother always used to say I'd live for this. But it's cut short by an ace arrow shot from Brother, who then gets to reap the reward. Damn, hell of a twofer. Gotta appreciate the little character arc these two went on together. With his gun out of order, thanks to the old man explosion, Dale constructs some TNT arrows and covers himself in war paint. As he prepares to go full-on sexual Tyrannosaurus, Jake and Nina emerge from the lake and finally get to the old paper mill, the source of all their deformed cannibalistic problems. They explore the place, including the manager's office, and find a dead body in a cabinet. But it's looking nearly skinny 
skinless to me, so I ain't putting it on the count. You know how I feel about bastard skellies. Skeletons don't count. Grow some skin, you fucks. They find a huge indoor junkyard of vehicles collected by the cannibals from their victims, and it's there that they find the production trailer, from which they hear M screaming in pain. Jake goes to help him, only to find that the sound source is a video feed, meaning he's unable to do anything as Ma Cannibal grabs a giant cleaver from the table and uses it to decapitate M. It's done off screen and mostly through squishy sound effects, but she does drop it in front of the camera at the end, so at least there's that. The cannibals arrive and kidnap Nina first, then knock Jake out of the trailer and hogtie him up as well. These kids would probably be screwed if not for Rambo Rollins over there. It's now up to him to save them from imprisonment from the cannibal family, whose lives have shades of the Sawyers and Texas Chainsaw 2, and the fucked up family in Troma's Mother's Day. Joe Lynch wanted to portray these mutants as a deranged domestic family, not just mindless freaks, even as they tear apart decapitated heads for their best parts. All around solid humanistic portrayals by the mutant performers, including Kill Count veteran Ken Kurzinger as Pa. Kurzinger played Jason in Freddy vs. Jason, and, if you'll remember from over three years ago on this channel, played a doll machete victim in Jason Takes Man Hatton. The mutant sister knocks Nina out with a gun, and when she comes to, things are even more Texas chainsaw-y, with Nina in the Sally Hardesty seat of honor for a cannibal feast. They even mimic some of the sound editing from that movie. <laughs> The family says grace, or at least their version of it, <laughs> and then it's time to chow down. Mmm, brown. Make sure you're a polite guest, Nina, and at least try everything once. There you go. We're nothing without our manners. Mother Cannibal takes a bucket of unused parts to a big disposal that looks like it could be a BattleBot final boss. Dale watches her from below, and eventually climbs through a grate to sneak up on the killers. A game mechanic goes off, alerting the Cannibal family to his presence, but he successfully evades their hunt and winds up shooting a dynamite arrow into Brother's back. We already know that Bro and Sis aren't good at pulling out, so the dynamite's still stuck in his back when the fuse runs out, killing them. Super strength is one thing, but ain't no cannibal surviving that mess. As Dawn approaches, Colonel Dale gets to Nina and Jake and helps them make painful bloody escapes from their bondage. Nina runs outside, but after getting Jake free, Dale is shot with an arrow through the back by Pa. Another arrow is put through his front, but it's Mom Mutant who gets to kill the man who murdered her children when she swings some razor chain around his neck. It squeezes the life and blood out of him, and he falls to the ground dead, bleeding out all over the place. The mutants catch up to Jake and beat the crap out of him right next to those whirly bits of death. They're pissed about their kids being killed. But Nina shows some character growth by returning inside to save Jake. She turns on a machine and it knocks Ma and Pa into the giant grinder, tearing them to bloody pieces and spitting out their remains into a few barrels below. Jake and Nina find Kimberly's Mustang and drive out in style, freeing themselves of this forest that still suffers from a toxic water supply. The movie ends with some of that sludge being put into a bottle, because the still living Three Finger has to take care of his newborn nephew named Three Toes. <laughs> How many people were voted off the survivors list and wound up on the kill count? Let's find out and get to the numbers. And then I just turn around. That's all I walk. That's it. There's my kitchen. 13 people died in Wrong Turn 2, with the victims consisting of 7 men and 6 women, a pretty even ratio. With a runtime of 97 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 7.46 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Kimberly Caldwell. What a way to start your movie, man. Not only is it full of guts, but to then see both halves of her casually dragged down the road, this kill may be the single best moment of the entire franchise. Dol Machete for lamest kill will go to Neil, I guess, even though it wasn't a bad kill, but the grainy camera POV made it seem pretty tame compared to the others. And that's it! Wrong Turn 2 Dead End came out direct to video in 2007. Next up, the cannibals are going to be chasing cops and criminals, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. 
This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Magnus Emil Bake, Kyle Gross, Andrew Tyndall, Savannah Habern, Makise Kurisu, and Jessica Kearney. Boy, it's just all downhill from here with this franchise. Tomorrow is another What's Your Favorite Scary Movie with another person from WWE. And I'll have new episodes of that for the next seven Saturdays. Be good people.